Hello, and welcome to another episode of Charles Weekly Partee. Today is going to be a little bit jam-packed. I have, well, two things to talk about, but one of those things is really big. So, I, I think it's going to be an interesting time. So, before I start talking about it, let's roll the intro. All right, so today I have, I mentioned that I do have a couple of things that I've, a bit one, one of the things I want to talk about today is really big and it's on the tech side. And before I go and start talking about all of that, I didn't want to take a week off from talking about architecture. Now, a couple of things I'd like to note out before um, I get too far into my episode today. First and foremost, if you listened to the last episode, episode 12, or watched it, you will have, you definitely will have heard a couple of tones. And that was to signify the areas where the camera decided to conveniently stop what it was doing. And when it decided to stop, well, let's just say I continued on and said, okay, camera decided it didn't want to keep going. And I ended up having to sort of play along. But the tones, I think, helped. Or were, those were the points where it was really, or where the camera decided to quit what it was doing. So I did go and take quality time to make sure that the audio was balanced on the tone so that it wasn't you hear me talking then you hear a much louder beep and I adjusted the time and volume so that your ears were not blasted out so um, in, fu in the future I may bring in the use of those tones um, whether I will or won't has sort of I guess I'll see what the future brings but if I need to really splice something where the where I have equipment failures, then you may notice that. But I do promise to make sure that that stays on the light side. Also, background noise, if you happen to hear it, the birds are active, and unfortunately my noise insulation isn't necessarily the best. So I, I've traded recording environments a little bit, so... Um, obviously, if you see the, uh, if you at least see part of the um, release on YouTube, then you'll have noticed that some that I've had a couple of different places where I've been recording. Now, where I am right now, not a lot of echo, which I'm really grateful for. But that does have a pretty big downside of not as much exterior noise insulation so uncontrollable outside noise I can't do too much about and well I it will probably seep in so if you happen to hear a bird chirping in the background that's why also to the tune of the YouTube um, release I do plan on have making a slight dependent change to it. So I've kept a pretty consistent audio release schedule on Mondays, and I actually happen to be recording this on a Monday, which means I'm recording it on the day I have to release it. So yay to one day production. But the video last time took an exceptionally long time to record for whatever reason, or not record, but upload to YouTube. And I was up for about an hour longer than I was anticipating. So, un unfortunately, as much as I like the upload to YouTube to be a completely hands-off process, occasionally things go wrong, and last week, no exception, things did end up going wrong. So, depending on the time that this gets, or that I finish my post-production, you may 
or may not have the video released to you on that on the same time. And I can I can guarantee that the audio version will be accessible before the video version is. And if you happen to be listening on Anchor, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, you'll notice the release within about 10 minutes of my doing it. But enough of the sort of behind the scenes and yes, you probably you that that's the chair creaking. I haven't gotten a uh, different chair, so still have that. Today, I want to talk about as I've mentioned a couple of things. The big thing is on the tech side, which is my take on the Google I.O. keynote. And that was a that that keynote to fit it into one podcast I think is a slight challenge, but doable. But I needed to keep a little bit of architecture involved because it's for I'd say I try and equally advocate my podcast to people interested in architecture and technology and people who aren't necessarily interested in either of them, giving them a perspective on the architecture and technology world. However, I, I know with the Apple keynote, I diverged a lot. Or, well, it didn't diverge a lot. I stayed on the Apple keynote, but it was a dedicated episode. As much as I would like to dedicate this episode completely to Google I.O., I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start off by talking about um, some a uh, playground in Italy, but I do plan on spending the majority of time talking about um, the Google I.O. So let's start playing. So I'm talking today about a playground in in Prato, Italy. Uh, I guess the mo the most formal name I could find because um, researching in Italian is always uh, researching things when half of your sources are or sources you can find are in Italian. Always interesting. But I really do want to talk about uh, go over the name that I can. So, Playground um, Macrolado Zero Prato. So, it's located in Prato, Italy. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, so apologies if I'm not. And, believe it or not, it was designed by the municipality's public space planning department. And I find that absolutely impressive. So, what makes this playground so special is that in the area that it's in, the area of uh, Prado that it's in, that area doesn't was completely void of public spaces and services prior to the construction of this playground. So really getting this or getting this in was absolutely astonishing and I, I guess the best way to put it it's it's like a splash of paint on a blank canvas you have everything everything looks almost the same and then you have one spot that sort of sticks out a little bit I'm not saying that's a bad thing because in this case it's a very good thing so, what it does is it takes the former uses of the site and helps contribute or take that into account for distributing the functions of the uh, playground itself. The design shapes follow different things, and when I mention, as I go over the functions, I'll mention the notable uh, former uses. So, you have one area that's a park, a green space designed for uh, just enjoying green space. 
You have a fitness area designed more towards, uh, as the name would suggest, um, having or doing exercise or whatnot. Not like an in, not, it's not an indoor gym. It's an out outdoor zone dedicated to anything and everything you could imagine doing fitness related. There's the notable playground, which um, is very important for people who live in the area who have kids and weren't able to really take them anywhere within short distance. That was uh, fun. And that's the, the playground piece is actually sitting on the area of the whole site, or the whole site that this um, playground and public space is on. This one, the playground is on the space that used to be illegal car parking and used to be a storage area. So, in, in some degrees, instead of the, or it turns from one of the least kid-friendly, um, least kid-friendly environments that it could possibly be into one of the most. You also have a skate park and an area that's uh, notably home to the water silos that take the uh, water storage for the area. And neighboring the um, back portion of the set, I guess you could call it, is a cinema. So the biggest thing about this playground is that, or I'm, I'm calling, when I say playground, I'm referring to the overall aspect or the overall site. So the overall site absolutely makes, makes use of my dear friend color. So, looking looking at it from above, you see what look basically patterns, patterns sort of street, same old, same old, and then, boom, you have the that whole site just stands out because of how the color involved in it ab absolutely stands out, and it, I think what what that ends up happening doing is make, making something where you don't feel you, you feel free from the natural rhythm of the area you're at an area where anything is possible where you can have fun think outside the box and I think that's kind of special the biggest thing that's probably, or that probably crossed around when I said how different that this site is from its surroundings from the area that it used to be, I mean, ima imagine a parking lot in an industrial area. May or may not be paved, and if it is paved, probably not very well. It's not like you're a brand new... Uh, shopping center, parking lot, it's more of, it would be more of your, um, cracked, pretty darn old environment, like the, basically something not pleasant. And, but believe it or not, the feedback regarding this site is almost entirely positive, right? So when you when we have a saying of um, designing for the people, and in this particular case, it's definitely a design for the people, and the people enjoy it, which, from an architecture perspective, means that there was success. Now, personally, I think turning what would be, what I could just imagine as being something I look at and want to look away from into something that 
makes me want to if i'm dri imagine driving past an old warehouse see the old warehouse you look at and say huh that's an old warehouse and drive on past drive past this playground you might say huh pretty good playground yeah, or, looks fun i should go there try it out That's a, and I think that's the sort of thing that shows how well the place is designed. That just going by, you might think, I want, I want to put aside what I'm doing now and visit that site. Speaking of bright and vibrant colors, I think it's time that I start talking about... Google's I.O. Key, opening keynote. So Google I.O. is a developers conference. And uh, in last year, it got canceled because of COVID. But this year, um, because of ev the way everything was going on, Google opted to hold this um, virtually which I think offered for some, or offered for many people the ability to attend when otherwise attending when otherwise attending might not have been possible. So myself personally included, I couldn't go out to a lot of these um, conferences ju just because of location and whatnot. But being able to attend virtually, absolutely wonderful. So, over the course of this keynote, which, um, if I remember correctly, lasted for about two hours, featured quite a few new features and planned upgrades and personally made me very appreciative for some of the work that Google is doing. Now, I know I haven't been necessarily a big fan of some of the uh, ways they work on ad monetization and whatnot, but I think that, or I think hopefully as people start requesting more and more privacy and especially with Apple raising the bar in some areas, of the uh, privacy spectrum, Google is, um, I, I think, sort of being pushed into an environment where they have to start providing some privacy if they want to compete with, um, want to really compete with iOS. Because the, I, I'm starting to see the two operating systems sort of get closer to each other, and one of the big differences currently being the um, one, one of the big perks for Apple being, yeah, you spend more money on our products, but you get more privacy. And I think Google's starting to work on tearing this down. So if they can provide providing more privacy, I think will definitely bring the level out, start leveling out the playing field. So, but before I start talking about Android and I will be talking about Android. Need to talk about some of the other stuff. I don't want to say less interesting. Because for for me and a lot of the work I do, some of the features that they announced are absolutely amazing. I'm looking forward to them. Other features, okay. I, I, Personally, I can't complain too much about anything in the uh, keynote. And one of the big things that some people may consider the boring stuff, but I consider pretty darn interesting, is the planned introduction of Smart Canvas. So, Smart Canvas will be coming in the fall of this year, but to some degree it's similar to task managing um, services uh, 
I guess examples would be things like Asana or Trello or um, yeah, there, there are a few of them. A lot of people uh, and businesses use them. But you'll be providing similar functionality. So the other thing encompassing the uh, this uh, smart canvas piece is that Google Meet will be coming to Docs, Slides, and Sheets. So what that means is, let's say you're working with four other people on a document. Yes, you can all work at the same, you can already work at the same time on the same document and see where everyone else is editing. But if you want to collaborate as if you're in the same room working on the same document, you can you'll be able to um, start a Google Meet straight in the um, program that you're in. And it'll, for Docs, for example, it will put the document on one side and then camera feeds on the other so that you can see people and see the document simultaneously without a problem, which personally I think is pretty amazing. Because right now, the only way to really do that is share a screen. And sharing the screen and having video feeds means you can't, right now, you can't really see the cameras at the same time as seeing the document in question, or at least not super easily. So, going further with um, Google Meet. Google announced that they'll be bringing noise cancellation to Google Meet, and whether or not that happens with on-device processing or cloud processing, I don't quite know. I, I know for some, the difference ends up being if you want to do, I know the background piece ends up happening on system. But um, basically the difference is if you have more limited resources using something like a uh, virtual background can be a little bit more taxing on your computer if you have a lower model computer. Whereas having a higher model, you could probably toss about three other things with it at the same time. But hopefully, uh, hopefully the noise cancellation will be um, something that ends up happening cloud side. I don't know. We'll see. But They've also announced the addition of companion mode. Don't know when that will be released exactly, but looking forward to it. So what companion mode is, is a new sort of layout for Google Meet that is there to enhance collaboration. So let's say you're working on something that isn't a Google document or a Google slide or Google sheet, then you can so let's say you're, what do you got? You're looking at a shared screen. You can have some people in one air, one area of the meeting, or more, more realistically, area of the screen, and then the people who are really important for you to see for that, you can put right next to the um, shared screen or shared content, so that you can see the important. People, not saying that one person is more important than another, but at whoever needs is most important to be seeing at a time, you can put in a larger size right next to it. Obviously, within your when you are in a larger meeting, this would be more important because then you have um, you could have a significant number of people at the bottom and a few people at the top. So. In a classroom environment, this might make it so that um, anyone, if someone's doing virtual learning and virtual presentation, you can have the teacher and the student um, or students presenting on the tiled piece and the important piece and the rest of the class at the bottom. So just just allowing you to focus on the people who you really want to be looking at at that particular moment. The next thing I want to talk about today is Lambda. So, I 
think Google released the um, what the abbreviation stood for, but I did not write that down, so I apologize. What it is is natural language understanding. So when you speak to a person, you don't speak exactly the same way that you might speak to Siri. Um, using Siri as an example here because that's um, the virtual assistant that I end up using the majority of the time. And to, when I talk to virtual assistant, I generally talk differently to the assistant than I would talk to a person sitting next to me. So if I if I had a person sitting on that side of me, or on one side of me, and a smart device sitting on the other. If I said some, or I could, I could stare straight ahead, not look at either of them, and just by the way I'm phrasing something, someone who is standing in the doorway might be able to tell exactly who I was talking to based on my choice of words. Because you don't talk to a computer the same way you talk to a human. For a human, I might say, or I might say something along the lines of, have you done it? Do you know of any good places to eat around here? Which would get a decent response. It's assuming the person I'm talking to knows decent places to eat around there. That's a different matter entirely. I wouldn't use that line talking to a virtual assistant. Talking to the virtual assistant, I might say, nearby places to eat, and then filter the results, uh, or sort the results by highest ratings. But you could see, I'm asking, trying to get the same information from two different uh, two different sources but I have to word it differently and what ended up happening uh, I was as it was demonstrated in the Google keynote was that it takes advantage of conversations being generative and how if you start a conversation with the same person, you're never going to have the exact same conversation path. Because would it really be enlightening then? It wouldn't. Imagine you went to Imagine every single time you went to talk to your best friend, you said the exact same sets of words to that friend without exception. That'd get boring for both you and your friend. Even if you start the same way, regardless of whether you're t starting with the same line, talking to the same person, your conversation is never going to, you're never going to have two conversations that are exactly identical. They'll always be slight, at least slightly different. And the moment it starts off being different, which would probably be if you say to your friend, hey, how's it going? once today and once tomorrow, I can promise you you're probably going to get, well, that's a little bit contradictory, but I can, I can say with some degree of certainty that the response you get from your friend tomorrow is not going to be the same response you got from your friend today. I think that's really what makes conversation so special. But taking advantage of that on a computer side is a little bit more tricky because the way computers are generally programmed or were originally programmed is in such a way of doing one thing or if you receive this set of instructions do this set of actions and having written code myself that's the way I 
hope everything works. If I give it a set of instructions, I'm praying that it's going to follow the set of instructions and give me the same result twice. If I run the program twice, I want to get the same result twice. Whether or not that happens in practice is a different thing. Hence the, uh, hence the usual cycle of bugs. But I, I, I know it's, it's interesting to watch what ended up happening. So the demonstrations that were done on screen were talking or were having a conversation between a person and whatever object that um, the computer was being. It was set to be for that particular moment. So the first um, experiment that they did had to do with, um, what's the word for it, was with Pluto. So asking, so talking to Pluto as if Pluto were a human. And with the computer having, being able to research things about Pluto, learning, teaching the computer how to talk as if it were a human. Or as if Pluto, basically as if Pluto could talk. And the second piece was a paper airplane. So asking a paper airplane what what it was like to uh, what what it's like to be a paper airplane. What happens when you fall in a puddle? Or what was your worst experience talking about falling in a puddle and not or how the paper airplane nearly fell apart? All coming from a computer. That was pretty astonishing. And one, one piece during the paper airplane uh, experiment there was asking how to make the best paper airplane. When the computer asked for clarification, it wasn't a, I don't understand, please try again. It was, well, what do you, not quite sure what you mean. Do you mean best as in flying as far as possible? Or best as in how long it'll stay in the air? If, at least I think that second one was what it was. But the person talking to the computer ended up saying, uh, it, choosing the how to make it fly as far as possible and then paper airplane responded with how to make a paper airplane that can fly as far as possible or what design trick to use to make it fly and that that was fascinating so now on to what i'd like to say the uh Less interest, less um, edge of my seat stuff, but definitely still nice to hear. Talking about making um, Google say, uh, sort of safer and slightly more private. Evidently, auto delete is now enabled on all new Google accounts, and I've heard that they're supposed to not at the keynote, but heard elsewhere that they're planning on rolling out two-step verification to all new accounts and possibly existing accounts or strongly recommending it but what auto delete does is after 18 months it automatically deletes activity data so basically what you searched what you did where you went all that fun stuff deleting that after 18 months or a year and a half. So it's definitely something that you can enable if you'd like um, at the present. And I think they said, I don't remember what the exact number it was that they had, 
but something in the billions of users. Or not necessarily users, but accounts have that enabled, I think. Either high millions or billions. So that was pretty nice to see. I have personally I have a lot of my activity data pieces turned off so that minimal information gets uh, collected. But nice to know that the little information that does will only be sitting around for another year and a half. So the other piece is password alerts. If you store your passwords with Google Chrome and have them cloud stored. So if you have password sharing by on your Google Chrome devices, then you'll have, you'll have this uh, feature. So what the password alerts do is detect whether or not a stored password should be changed. Maybe it's too simple or maybe it just appeared in a data breach and offer in theory offers a quick and easy way to change them so basically guiding you through the steps of here you're here and change it boom all done to try and make it as minimal of a project as possible and having had to change a few passwords in the past week or so not fun So the next thing that'll be that I found it interesting, but it is not necessarily going to make an apparent difference to most of the rest of the world. And most of the rest of the world being um, consumer market rather than the business market, because the business market's very likely to enjoy this. The tensor processing unit, V4 also known as the TPU V4. So evidently these are much more powerful chips than the previous generations of TPUs, which I have yet to look into, but definitely want to. And for their cloud computing um, pods, a single um, V4 pod will hold 4,096 TPU V4 chips. I think that's pretty amazing because each, each of those pods can now process data, er, can now process data by the exaflop, which is absolutely astonishing. So, and each pod has theory because of the advance or because of the advances of the chips that they have each pod's supposed to have 10 times the previous generation's amount of interconnected um, communication so making it all that much faster so cloud compute units end up being more fun for when you need to run something that your desktop processor wouldn't necessarily like you doing. When I say like you doing, I mean do in a reasonable amount of time. So obviously 4,000 processors can do a lot more than the single chip or single chips sitting inside of your computer. The other piece that's um, useful to know about their more advanced computing is that Google has been doing significant work on a quantum computer and they actually demonstrated this in a pretty uh, funny way and when I say it when I say funny I do mean funny as in even someone who doesn't know much about computers could watch it and get a little bit of a laugh out of it but um, explained it in such a way that if you're more of a computer nerd, you'll get it. But if you're not as much of a computer nerd, you'll probably still get it. And when I say get it, I'm talking about the understanding of how the quantum computer is supposed to work. So 
looking forward to seeing where that goes. This quantum computing is... It would basically make some of our most powerful computers right now look like the... A quantum computer in comparison to super com a present-day supercomputer be the difference between... Or it would be similar to the difference between a present-day supercomputer and the type of computer that NASA had when the... Uh, what do you call it? When they were launching the um, mission to the moon. That kind of difference in performance. Which I think would really unlock amazing new possibilities. Every time we make technology more capable, we can do quite a lot more with it. And depending on the amount of work needed to produce a certain computers, it can be worthwhile just in the amount of materials that they can save. So, be interesting to see where that goes. Next thing I would like to talk about is MUM, or which stands for Multitask Unified Model. And MUM is, in theory, supposed to take over um, some of the work that BERT currently does. So basically the way Google processes um, search terms so instead of looking for, as I was mentioning before with Lambda, talking about, near, instead of saying to Google, nearby, nearby five-star restaurants, you might say something that you might actually say to a human, or what are the best places to eat around here? I think that's pretty darn interesting. Ta uh, being right now, you don't even want to think about searching Google for um, what would be a nice place to eat around here because the search results are probably not going to help you out very much. But when Mum starts rolling out, you'll have that ca you'll have that capability, which. Personally, I think is quite impressive. Um, moving along, <clears throat> Google Lens. Um, currently, pretty helpful tool used to trans. I think, don't remember the time frame, but translating billions of um, words. Time frame sort of matters, but I think I think they said so far has been used to translate over 2 billion words. So, pretty impressive. And they're working on giving it more insight into interlingual applications. So, let's say you're studying, you have a homework assignment that happens to be in a non-native language. Google Lens will enable you to scan that assignment and get help with it in your native language. So, you want to, or let's say you, you have calculus stuff in front of you and you want to and scan it f for help on how to get integrals. Let's say the assignment happens to be, um, I don't know, for, for me, it could, I, for me, I know, I don't know French, so let's say the assignment happens to be in French. All right, and I'm not as familiar with integrals. I can use the Google Lens to look at it and get link or get help in English on how to solve the integral. Now, that being um, shown not in a English person trying to find help because most things are a lot of things are offered in English already. Having someone who's learning English as a second language, being able to get that in their own native language, very useful.
Okay. One of the things that I really enjoyed learning about was Google Maps. Now, not the most entertaining thing, but hear me out. The advances in Google Maps, I think, are spectacular. So the most notable piece, things that they did is they added 150,000 kilometers of bike lanes. It also helps that a lot of bike lanes were added over the um, course of the pandemic when biking what became, in some areas, more popular and more um, frequent than driving. But also, in theory should be out now, is indoor navigation. So let's say you're in a um, pretty popular airport Goodness knows that those are places you can get lost. You can use uh, Google Maps to look look around and find your way um, to places. It can point out, hey, there's an escalator over there that gets you to where you want to go. And in, also in cities, you could stand at a street corner and using um, the camera that you have, look at look at the surroundings have road names pop out of the road so you can tell what road you're on if there happens to conveniently not be a corner road sign. I've been there plenty of times. And see nearby places to eat. So you could hold up, ooh, restaurant. You can see what the restaurant is, get reviews pretty quickly, all that fun stuff. I think that's pretty cool. But if you happen to be driving... There are two big features that are going to be rolling out to Google Maps. The first being safer routing. And what safer routing does is instead of, if you want to get a safer route, it can look at trends of people tra going through that area to determine what areas, even based on time, might be more likely to have to go and have a, a sudden stop. So we've, we've all been there before, having to slam on our brakes to, or at least if you're driving, having to slam on your brakes to avoid hitting someone who just decided to pop out of the middle of nowhere. Or do something um, a little bit more reckless, or without necessarily paying attention, that causes you to have to slam on your brakes. And what safer routing can do is guide you to an area where that chances of that are little to none. I think that's a very nice thing, especially for people who may not have the greatest um, reflex time. So maybe if you're uh, maybe if it's a little bit later at night and you'd normally have good reflexes, they say, hmm, feel, feeling not at hundred percent, and I'm saying I'm saying this very cautiously. Obviously, if you do not feel up to driving, or if you do not feel like it's safe for you to drive, then don't, please. But if you're driving, you say, you know what, it's starting to get late. I don't want to chance. I don't want a chance going through an area that I'm going to. Have, I'm almost guaranteed to have to go and slam on my brakes to avoid hitting someone. Safe route will make your life easier on that. Or maybe an older driver who's not able to see quite as well could benefit from that as well. Last but not least, eco-friendly routing. And what that is, is... For lack of better words, the route that is going to be the most fuel efficient to take. So taking into account traffic patterns, um, ro or nearby roads, this, that, and the next thing, traffic lights, all that fun stuff, to figure out which route is going to be the most fuel efficient route to go. And that that's useful for a lot of people. It, whether you want to save gas or all the time, or if you want to uh, 
or let's say you happen to be running a little bit closer to that empty marking and you want to go and get the, you're getting directions to the gas station but you want to take the route that's least likely to uh, cause you problems that'll help there too so Google Photos <clears throat> The couple of quick things there is that they're adding in little patterns to be able to detect when someone, when there's this little trait. So maybe it detects um, someone wearing a rain jacket or the example they used, someone having an orange backpack. Being able to find photos that have the same sort of similar, or have one similar trait, and grouping them together. So, that, that I think will unlock some pretty cool uh, memories because maybe you wouldn't think, oh, you got, you take pictures of other people and then someone takes a picture that, take pictures this, that, and the next thing, you can try and figure out which ones are the most relevant for memory. However, another feature that they added is useful not for the addition of photos and whatnot, but for the removal of them. So, for instance, let's say um, you've bro you broke up with someone and you don't want to see the pictures of that person popping up into your um, formed memories or into your uh, photos group. You can have those hidden or let's say one of the memories that has been grouped is too painful for you. You can remove a memory altogether. And when I say remove a person, you can say remove, you can have it figure out to remove any images that have a person. Whether or not that'll work 100%, don't know, but it'll be interesting to see, and I think that's a um, very nice feature to have if you need the end up needing it. Lastly, to finish photos on a positive note, the ability to turn two similar static images into one moving one. So I don't have a modern Android device, but I have a um, slightly modern Apple device. And what I have on my Apple device is something called live photos to be able to sort of take a photo with a little bit of motion. So it's almost like a very, very miniature video. It's like a two video frames or some, something along those lines, micro frames. I don't, I don't know the exact way they do it, but you got the idea. <clears throat> What's being added into Google Photos is the ability for two images to be selected that are similar. So Basically, don't take a picture of your dog and your kid and have it try and change those into one consistent um, background or one consistent uh, little thing like that. That won't work well. But you have two pictures of your dog in a that you took in succession. So, you know, taking pictures to make sure that at least one of them comes out decently. And taking those photos and making it having artificial intelligence go and basically create new frames in between the two to create a little miniature uh, animation clip which I think is pretty cool I'd like to talk about pretty darn riveting piece of their announcement with Android 12 Rather than focusing on Material Blue, they decided to focus on what they called Material U. So maybe Google has a penchant for enjoying blue on their homepage, 
that little blue sign in button the Google the G of the Google on home page that's blue biggest letter is blue the uh, search results come back most of them are blue but instead of blue the color that best suits you maybe that's pink or purple or yellow green or red or even some some other um, maybe something like teal well whatever and whatever color ends up suiting you best that is material you so selecting a color in Android that follows you around different or goes and applies to different applications to be able to pick a color palette that is most fitting to you and in it, putting that into the overall ecosystem I think that's really nice and if you have a Google Pixel I believe this was Google Pixel um, explicit or exclusive not explicit thank you very much being able to pick up color palettes from your wallpaper so that your color theme matches your wallpaper and that color theme extends to widgets um, to time all that basically the whole way the phone ends up working out all designed around that color that you've chosen. Now, more about Android 12. They'll be adding in some new widgets and a bunch of different privacy features to keep it short. And the private, big privacy features that they're adding in are not having ad tracking between applications, Having a camera and microphone indicator in the top of the screen, similar to the way um, I, iOS and iPadOS do it right now. To one-up Apple, a direct kill switch for the camera and mic, so you can, it's, soft, it's uh, software, not hardware, so you can access the, um, I don't know what the Android term is for it, but the control center to be able to um, flip that off for all applications. So basically, whatever whatever you have that would be able to use the camera, if you hit the camera toggle switch, wouldn't be able to, which I think is pretty darn interesting. And you have that for the microphone as well. Lastly, the privacy dashboard that they'll be adding in to Android 12 will allow users to easily view and change um, permissions straight from the or from that dashboard so for any application you can change you can look at the dashboard and quickly access the settings to revoke privacy permissions so maybe you want to allow something to use the camera today but then tomorrow you change your mind you don't need to you don't need to do a lot of digging around you can get to it pretty quickly. So, next on my list is what happens when you combine Wear OS and Tizen. And for those who don't know, Wear OS is by Google, Tizen is by Samsung. Well, when you add those two together, you get Wear. So that's what Google was referring to it as during the keynote. So whether or not it will be called Wear Wear OS, we'll see as the uh, t as time goes on. But it's a collaboration between Google and Samsung to take the best of both of their devices, um, operating systems, and combine them into one. So adding in both of those features and then adding in some new crispy ones inspired by Fitbit, which Google recently acquired. So, 
Long story short, the combined operating system will be present on um, uh, what, whichever uh, Google smartwatches you get that would normally have Wear OS and Samsung uh, smartwatches as well. Next, the next thing um, that they announced that I didn't realize was a problem, but happy to note um, is or it was a problem, is that uh, I guess the way they had programmed the camera wasn't exactly ideal for everyone. So, for people with uh, darker skin tones. The camera applica er, camera was not necessarily um, generating the photo or er, running the algorithms that it does in the photo in a way that best helps um, everyone. So, long long story short, what they ended up doing is changing the way the white balancing happens to make sure that if it can tell that there's um, that a person in the photo has a darker skin tone that they're able that it's able to detect that and balance the colors properly to be able to do it or to make it look um, more natural and if they um, if their system works similar to the way Apple's does, a lot capturing a bunch of photo data but allowing you to change the way it works afterwards with that data, I think that'd be pretty. That's that'd be nice too. So that maybe if it isn't one hundred percent on point, you can change that later as well. But definitely shouldn't have to uh, deal with bad photos just because you happen to have a different skin tone. Next, on the health front, I, pro I promise I'm almost done here. There are a only a couple more things. The investigation of using artificial intelligence in breast cancer screening. So right now, to the best of my understanding, um, there can be, in some circumstances, little bit of a wait on getting back um, mammogram results. So what the artifact what they're working on get it part they've partnered with um, Medical Institute but trying to get and train an artificial intelligence um, program to be able to scan over mammograms, to determine or to try and determine if something doesn't necessarily seem right so that if some and if something doesn't seem right to flag it for a more in-depth review so i think that definitely would be a possible it would be a nice thing to see um to be able to use use the power that we have in computers to be able to try and more effective or try and help to screening so that the people who are the humans who have the skills to really in-depth look at things are spending their time making or looking at the important ones to double and triple check right before i talk about what i think was one of the most interesting things about their keynote um Google did talk a little bit about what they're doing on the um, on their side to try and become as carbon neutral as possible, and the big thing that really stood out to me was um, trying to work on getting all of their uh, systems on twenty four seven clean energy, but also looking at smart load shifting, so basically assigning um, computer tasks when to times that they know that the computer will be in a lower power state or not lower power state excuse me in a state of having 
um, you're in a time where the renewable energy is in larger sub larger supply. So basically, for solar panels, trying to if you have if solar panels are your main source of renewable energy, doing it at shifting as much computing as you can to the time when those are going to be at their peak. That's pretty nice. And working on new features with their new campus to have um, dragon scale solar on it as well. And that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. It might be something that combines both architecture and technology, which means I'm really looking forward to seeing how that turns out. Now, last but not least, Project Starline. So what Project Starline is, is an environment where, or, well, when you can't just sit across from someone and you're staying inside, but you still want to sit, but nothing can really replace that sitting across from someone at a table and actually sort of feeling like they're there or having their presence as close as you can. As long as you can forgo having the uh, sort of little hug at the end, Project Starline would make that a lot, would make a very realistic experience without um, needing to be in, per without needing to be actually sitting across the table at someone. So the way Project Starline works is has a bunch of different um, sensors get, getting 3D scans and mapping, active mappings of your face to try and map out where you are, depth, all that fun stuff, and quickly compress what's about, or what's a whole big ton of data into a much smaller amount and compress that, send it off to the other end where it gets displayed on a custom display that Google has to, that's able to sort of mo motion track where you are as well and take that data and also sort of shift the image. So if, I'm, if you move over to one side of you or move over to the other side, it will look as if the person is actually sitting there, not just a uh, face on a screen. I think that's really nice. To be able to, and the people who are talking about it during the keynote said that for, in their experience, it ended up being, feeling as if they were actually sitting across from the person. I think it's outstanding that we're, we're able to get to the point where you can, where someone sitting looking at a screen is able to feel just as if they were sitting across from an actual person. Sort of scary on one side, but pretty cool. Now, I know it's been a lot but I tried as best I could to talk about what interest or what most caught my attention during the Google I.O. Um, keynote for this year. And that, that's, that, a lot of that's been on my mind. I, I, I can't wait to see these features actually present. So before I call it quits for the day, um, I do hope that you enjoyed this exploration of the in-depth sort of um, discussion of the uh, keynote that Google put out and of the fun little uh, playground in Prado, Italy. So if you'd like to hear more episodes of Charles Weekly Part T, please subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And you can go to anchor.fm slash Charles Weekly Part T, 
where you can go and simply listen to every single episode released, but you can do that on whichever platform you choose. The special pieces about Anchor are that you can leave a voice message that I can, so maybe writing down something doesn't necessarily capture it best, but leaving a voice message is the best way to give your feedback on how what you thought about a particular episode or what you've thought about the series so far. And you can support the podcast and support the development of future episodes as well. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you enjoyed it, please be sure to leave a review. And if you want to actually see me talk and deliver my weekly party, then you can watch that action on YouTube. So, my party for the week is get excited, little things can make a big difference. Uh, that That's evident in both the keynote and the um, playground development where just a little change where a little bit of change made a lot of bit of difference so take care hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you in the next one Thank you.